Hello, this is Berkshire Family History Presents. Our guest today is Gloria Morse. Gloria has been a long-term resident of Richmond, and she's done an exceptional amount of work researching the history of Richmond and its stories. Gloria is the chairperson of the Richmond Historical Commission, and she's here today to share her stories, her history, that she has explored while living in Richmond. Welcome, Gloria. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, to start off, this is just a general slide from 1910 of the Main Street in Richmond. And from here, you will, I will go on a little bit later and tell you about it. In um, 1755, this is what New England looked like, Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it's pretty well um, settled right up to Worcester County. Um, it changes. And then this is what, the, if you do the close up of what Berks wasn't Berkshire County at the time, you've got your Native American Indians and Housatonic. Um, Stockbridge is the. Um, See how Housatonic is spelled? Stockbridge is spelled okay. Pittsfield is there. Um, Great Barrington and Sheffield are also there. But this is all vast open land. It's all open. Now in 1744, John, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name, he's an Indian claimer, and um, Yoka, who will go on to get his name into something else, sold land in what was Hampshire County at that time uh, for 12 pounds. And they filed that in 1745. And um, then in June of 1762, it was labeled Richmond, um, the township number eight, sold to Samuel Brown. Um, other grants were to Asa Douglas. Now, Asa got over 3,000 acres, and his land went from Austerlitz all, all the way to Wood, Williamstown. Then we have Charles Goodrich from Pittsfield. He had the north end of Mount Ephraim and Yoakum Town. And then we get into with Asa Douglas, Josiah Dean also bought with him and others. And then they got a second second um, piece of land that they bought from the Indians. I don't know how we're. Um, Peter Wilcox from Great Barrington was given um, a grant through the. Yeah, he was given a grant anyways. The lot 24, and the first division, which is now where our new community um, building is. Now this is the Indian deed from 1754, which was taken out of the Cade New York book, and it's also filed in Albany. Now um, he had 44, Asa Douglas and Josiah Dean had 44 men who purchased this from the Stockbridge Indians, and they were thought they were settling in the King's District in Cade New York. So he, he buys. And then this is the second deed that went through. This is actually filed much later. King Ben and several of the other ones with the same names that were on the first deed sold a six mile square plot of land to Richmond. Um, and it wasn't Richmond at the time. It was, it was um, just Indian territory. And it's. Well, here's how they, and this is your Indian signatures with their, they used like the bear paw. They didn't actually, they signed their names, but they also had Indian signs for what they, what they did. Now, um, after these two men purchased the two separate plots, the um, Massachusetts Bay Colony put plot number, um, yeah, plot well, number eight on the um, auction block in 1761. And in 1762, Samuel Brown purchased that, which then gave a big problem. And this is, this is, 
this is how it's laid out. And it's not gonna, it's where the blue arrow is. So, then along, if you look in the, um, any of the history books that are written, you come across the name Micah Mudge. Micah came from the colony of Connecticut. And um, he was said to have come here in 1760, but I, I question that date now. After further research, I found out he was a millwright. So he was sent into the towns to set up um, mills on waterways, and they would need that to cut lumber and grind grain and bark, any other things that a, a mill was needed for. His father and his four brothers were also millwrights. Um, Caleb was in Lanesboro, Abraham went to Austerlitz, Jervis was in Canaan, and Abel, Abel was also listed in Richmond, but not listed on any of these documents that they show you. So, and then there's another man who they claim in the 1760s, Ichabod Wood, from Rehoboth, Mass. Um, he had a, his first wife had died. He had grown children from the first wife. He had the second wife with, with children. And his youngest son was Ichabod, who came to Richmond when he was eight years old. And he was another one. He gave me much more trouble hunting for him because uh, he just didn't show up. He says he's a gentleman. Well, lo and behold, one deed, it shows up. He's running a grist mill on the Cone Brook town. So now we know what he does. Um, also, Mudge had sold most of his land before the Revolutionary War started. And um, when he did that, he, he retained the mineral rights. Now, one of the pieces of property he sold, he sold to Stephen and William Benton. And they ran a tannery on the um, Cone Brook. They purchased it very early, 1768. Um, and I should tell you that the town was incorporated 1765, so it's, it's three years after his. Now, Ichabod Wood had a, a unfortunate incident. His son, who was 14 at the time, died on October 24th, so they're milling something uh, 1764, he is in Center Cemetery. This is a stone. And a year later in March, the town appropriated the land for Center Cemetery, half acre. This is Center Cemetery and Ichabod Stone is right in the very front of that small half acre. Now, we have in the cemeteries these stones that were locally carved out of local, very soft marble, and they're called soul effigies. And if you look at the face, it represents the sun, the moon, and then you have the stars on the top. You have the water on the edge, which is the beginning and no end. And um, the earlier people were very, very um, concerned about their well, their soul's welfare. So a lot of these will say, um, nor sex, nor age can death defy. Think mortal what it is to die. So there's, I think there's 36 of these stones in the different cemeteries in town. Um, Josiah Dean, who also had land in Canaan, he's one of our first men who bought from the Indians, lost his wife at the age of 68 and she's buried in the Cohen Hill Cemetery. Now their son, Josiah Jr., had property in Richmond, um, but he chose most of the time to live over in Canaan. Now, in 1760, back to 1765, this is what Richmond um, and Mount Ephraim and Yoakum Town, when they were incorporated in 1765, um, Massachusetts Bay Colony made a mistake, and they named it Richmond instead of Richmond, after the Duke of, of Richmond and the, and the um, Duke of Lennox. So we've got 
this is this is what your map looks like and there are grants there's the little square that's in there it's one of the grants that was given Lennox had um, five grants where Richmond Richmond had none now this is when the um, Samuel Brown came into buying the land plantation number eight which he later named Yoakum Town and Mount Ephraim, he had to lay out a plant, plot plan. The Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Court of Common Pleas demanded that each person setting up a town had to lay it out. So these are laid out in 100-acre plots with numbers. So you can go back to the very early deeds and find out exactly where these people were living. You won't, in 100 acres, you won't know where the house is, but where the blue arrow is down is where um, what now separates Richmond from Lennox. So there's a big dividing line. And I should mention, Richmond Pond was in Yoakum Town. It was only uh, 98 acres in size, and it's now 218 because it's been enlarged three times as a mill site for the Barker Mills and Pittsfield. And the pond is, is a third in Pittsfield and two thirds in Richmond. This is a view of Richmond Pond looking north. Now, whoever did up this 1764 map was really, really good. The, the part that's Lennox, as you can see at the bottom, somebody has listed the book and page for each of the plot owners. So it makes it very, very good to go back. And look, they didn't, if they did it for the Richmond side of it, it doesn't exist. Now this is um, the Court of Common Pleas also made every so many years, the selectmen of the towns show where their roads were, their highways, their mills, uh, waters and streams, and sometimes the um, groves of trees. Now this is the selectmen's map for Richmond for 1794. And there were roads through, ta through town before the town was actually settled. You have that market to Kinderhook, which came over 295, and then you had the road from Hartford to Lebanon Springs, which came through the middle part of the town. And then by 1800, you had the 10th Massachusetts Turnpike come through that went from, um, that also went from Hartford to Albany. Um, by this time, the meeting house had moved from down by Rossiter Road up to where it is now, which is uh, about a half a mile up the road. And I apologize for this. This is the 1830 selectment map, also ordered by the Court of Common Pleas. And the arrow shows where the center is now, where the Congregational Church is in the town hall. And then for a future talk, the Richmond Furnace is further to the south. Now we have, we have some unusual things in Richmond. One is the Boulder Train, which was discovered by Stephen Reed in 1842. Um, Charles Lyle got a hold of it, who is a geologist, and Edward Hitchcock. And it's still studied today. Geologists come through. There are seven trains that run through town. They start over on the hill, Fry Hill in Canaan, and it'll go already all the way down into Lee, these different ones. Now here's a picture of one of the boulders. This is on Route 41, and south of the center of town. And then this is the biggest one that's up on Perry's Peak, north of the cemetery, if you were to walk that way looking for them. And then we have Stevens Glen, um, named for the Stevens family. And this, this has a 40-foot waterfall drop that runs pretty much year-round. The uh, great-grandson of one of the Stevenses, Romanzo, in the 1920s, charged 25 cents in mission to people who came um, by train from New York and Boston to picnic and dance at his pavilion. So he had, he had quite a tourist attraction back then. And this is what it looked like 
in the 1900s. I don't think it flows quite as much now because the pipeline cut through it, but it, that's one of our attractions. Now, this is the main street, and we start in, the reason I give you this, it's two stores, there's one on the left and one on the right, and the depot is to the right. Um, the railroad came through Richmond in 1841, and it, it divided the town at that time, and it also flooded more of the swamps. And I shouldn't say swamp, they're marshes. Um, but this is from your first picture that you all saw on my slide. This is looking the opposite direction within a, in a quarter of a mile. Now here we are back to that one again, which shows um, housing. The um, second one on the right is an older house. The blacksmith is in the distance. And further in the distance would be where the depot is. And that was a community center. Everybody came to get their mail at one of the stores. Um, when Telegraph came in, the news came in on the, to the train station, so people went there to find out what was going on. This is the Furnace Railroad Station. And notice that there's a, that's the spur track that goes down to the furnace. Um, this this particular building burned in 1910, and it was rebuilt. And then this is a, what a typical steam locomotion motive would have looked like in three years. Oh. Help. All right, we're going to go fast. We got steam trains. It goes to diesel, the, fir the depot being moved, the center of town. In 1903, we had a telephone company come in, and it's still Pertinent today, 23 subscribers, $70 per share, and $18 a month. Um, farming was our typical thing um, with the mining coming in second. This is the 1856 Beers map. We had the Iron, Iron Limestone Company, which was started way back in the 1790s. That's one of the quarries and the little and this is what Richmond would be like today. And I, I didn't tell you, the, um, the west side of Richmond is borders on Canaan, New York. The north is Hancock, Mass, and Pittsfield. The east is Lenox, and the south is Stockbridge and West Stockbridge. So we were 19, 19 square miles, and the population's 1,500 rounded off from the um, 2020 census. So, and there, we've done it. <laughs> Keep going. That's it, I'm finished. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Uh -huh. So. Yeah, we should back up three minutes. Yes. Right. You so. can do some more if you'd like. Well, I, we've already skipped through <laughs> quick. Just to go. No, I was waiting to hear. Um, yeah, this lime business um, was interesting because Timothy Cole had started it way, way, way back. And there's a, a diary of George Holcomb over in Steventown where in the 1790s came to Richmond to buy lime. Mm -hmm. So um, this was taken. There were three other companies that came in. Pittsfield Lime and Stone went bankrupt. So that ended it, and then the property was taken over by the town. That's, that's it, if you want to talk more about that. Um, can you tell us a little bit verbally about some of those people that you mentioned earlier? They apparently <clears throat> were town fathers or town farmers. Uh, tell us a little well, bit. Well, Micah Mudge was involved heavily with town affairs. In fact, the second meeting that they had, he was supposed to be a moderator for their meeting. Mm -hmm. And he asked to be excused because he had some kind of urgent business in Albany. So whether he's taking iron ore over there to be smelted or whether he's going over to get iron pieces to put back into his mill site, I don't know. That's my guess uh, what he's okay. up to. Yeah. Um, he also shows up on the seating plan for the meeting house. And even though it says he's married, he's sitting with a single man in the back of the building. Oh. And when I look for Abigail's death, it shows her dying in 
Sharon, Connecticut. So I don't think he moved his family up here. Uh, so see. who knows? Who it's knows? a guess. One who, of the mysteries, yes. Uh, they yes. also claim that his third child was born in Richmond, but there's no documentation of that, and you couldn't document it because it wasn't a town at the time that this is being settled. Oh, okay. So figure out how he did that. Uh, and yeah. his son's children, Ichabod, or Ichabod, Michael Mudge Jr.'s family was there. In fact, he lost, he lost several of the children, and there's no death record for them or no burial records. Oh, that's remarkable. So, that's surprising. So do you think they died here? Or? They died here. They did. There's and, just then, no and then there. Mudge sold out, like I say, just about the time of the revolution. Yeah, the Revolutionary War. He went back over to Canaan, but then he goes further into New York State, probably to open up more mills in that area. Ah, uh, so mills were a big business here. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And did they grind grain, or what kind of mills? Well, they would were start out when they're settling a town. Yes. They would. Um, they would have to have the lumber for people to build their houses. They oh. built the framing out of out of logs, which they hewed down. But then for your planking and your roof boards, you I need see. lumber. Yes, yes, yes. So milling was the primary business, would you say? Mills? At that time. Yeah. We still got five minutes? Yes, yes we wow. do. Wow. Keep talking. OK. Let's so. do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the mills were the primary business, and of course, farming. Am I correct? Farming. And then it went to, by um, which Bill's going to get into um, 1829, I believe it is. Um, they started um, mining I was iron ask ore. About that. Yeah. And Bill, Bill does a whole separate one on. But this Mudge, if you look at Mrs. Annan's book, it'll say she didn't know that there was iron enrichment until the 1820s. And this Mudge, who was back in the 1760s, knew it was there. He kept the, the iron and the mineral rights to whatever was found on that property, and he sold that separate. So there were mining um, operations that were going on here. And Very when early. it was mined, uh, how, was it transported by train? Well, Bill will get into all that. Yeah. I'm going to stay out of it and just okay. do the, the early history. Um, OK, OK. Well, they had 100-acre plots. Mm -hmm. and, and very soon after their 100-acre plots, they, um, they would sell to a family member, or they would. One guy got 100 from his uh, father-in-law. Then he proceeded to sell 50 acres of it to a person who was uh, what did they, a house right, which I believe he built the man's house for oh. that. That mm -hmm. trade off. I see. Oh, yes. And then yes. as you get more children mm -hmm. and you get more relatives or more whatever, then they turn around and um, break down the land so it gets down sure. to five acres, two yeah, acres. Yeah. It has to be divvied up. Yeah. Divvied up. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you've done some cemetery tours. Um, that and you showed some pictures of right. uh, back of some of the headstones. Right. Uh, you must find some fascinating history on some of these cemetery tours. Well, you do. The, and it's interesting. Some of these early men who settled here actually lived over in Canaan, but then you find their relatives buried in our cemetery. How did that happen? Well, they were over here too. Oh, okay. Yeah. The the town, the, the the dividing line between the two states and the towns really yeah. did not mean yeah, anything. Yeah, I see the. You, you know, that, yeah. it's yeah. So there was it's a lot of movement back and forth. Back then. and forth, yes, yes. and then by the by the time after the Revolutionary War, a lot of these first settlers moved on to New York State. They moved on to um, Vermont to newer territories, the new frontiers that they could yeah, resettle. Yeah, yeah. So they so moved to Vermont. They moved and, to Vermont. And New York State. Right. Yeah. yeah. The middle of New York. Yeah. I was and of course, that displaced also the, the Native American Indians as they sold off more and more of their land. They were also transported out and put on reservations. Yeah, that's in, a in tragic story. Yeah, Shakers. yeah. Um, yeah, so the cemetery tours have given you some more insight into names and places, or names essentially, that you have researched and looked into. We, it's been, we spent, another woman and I spent eight years 
going through the <laughs> four burial grounds, four private burial grounds, mm -hmm. and then that didn't satisfy us. So we had to start digging up obituaries to go with, to I'm make these people digging real. Digging up obituaries <laughs> and not digging up. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, Gloria. And the lost, <laughs> the lost stones that are gone out of these um, burial grounds, you know, when yeah. you think 200 years. Yeah. Um, we didn't take good care of our cemeteries. I know they don't. They really and, uh, yes. At one time, they took 11 cords of wood out of Thunder Cemetery. So what kind of damage that caused, I don't yeah. know. Gloria, this has been remarkable. You have done so much history about Richmond. Uh, I'm sure it engages you and continues to engage you. As you said earlier, you find out new information each time you turn around and go into another corner. It's fascinating, and I think that learning about the migration of people into New York and other places out of Richmond tells a story about history and how people have always moved from right. place to place. The majority of them came out of Connecticut. Yeah. Very few came from Massachusetts. Yeah. So, so that's fine. This has been <laughs> great. I never knew this much about Richmond. It's remarkable. I'm glad you gave this information to us. And this history of names and people, I think, makes history interesting because you gave us those pictures. And when you put names to the places, it engages us. It makes us feel more right, knowledgeable. Right, right. So thank you again, Gloria. Come again, visit us, and enjoy the various programs that you do wherever you are. Okay. And uh, always, the welcome mat is always here for you. Thank you. Thank you again, Gloria. You're welcome.